Asile, the Engineer and the Island. Week 14, Day 1. I had an idea while I was falling asleep last night to help make construction of the tower easier. So after my morning chores, I held off on assembling all those bricks, and instead worked on cutting down some more bamboo. Some of it I peeled and put into the loom to make a coarse mesh. The rest I used to make a support framework for the inner and outer sides of the wall. The idea was that the concrete is so viscous that I could line the tower's bamboo frame with the mesh and fill it in as one big mold. I wish I'd thought of this yesterday when I was digging out all those brick molds, but there's nothing I can do about that now. I considered using them to line the inside wall, but I also wanted that area to be as hermetically sealed as I could get it, so I decided to just cast that as well. Another problem was that the loom would take all day to build the mesh I needed, and I suspected that I wouldn't be able to reuse it, so that'll become another daily limiter on how quickly I can build this thing. Considering how tired I am right now, and how I keep making stupid mistakes by not slowing down thinking, I wonder if that may be for the best. This project is going to take me two weeks no matter what, so I guess I actually have plenty of time. It was lunchtime when I'd finished with the outer framework, and afterwards I finished building the inside framework, at which point I'd kind of run out of things to do, other than to make sure the loom stayed loaded. I'm still mad at myself for putting myself a day behind, but the truth is, I'm really not behind at all. The rate of lime production is what's holding me back, not how fast I can lay bricks. Yes, a whole lot of that lime got wasted making bricks I don't need now, but they also make a kind of lovely cobblestone courtyard around the base of the tower, if nothing else. Since I had time to kill, I figured I might as well use it for thinking ahead, rather than behind, like I've been doing. The water pumping system wasn't entirely finished, so I used the latex I'd been stockpiling each morning to make some more pipes for water going up and down the tower. I also made several valves to control the water that'll flow in and out of the different levels. Near the top of each level will be an overflow pipe, which is basically a big straw that leads from the top of one level into the other. That way, the tower will fill the highest potential energy cistern, the top one, first, and any excess will flow down to the others so that pressure doesn't build up and break the concrete. At the bottom of each level will be a valve that lets me open it up to the main output line, which I reinforced heavily with bamboo cord, since it and the main input line will be under the greatest pressure. It occurred to me at this point that I couldn't have all the cisterns feeding into the same line at once, otherwise the ones on top would just overflow into the ones underneath them and make them burst. So I made some one-way valves in addition to manual valves, just to be safe. Finally, I used the remaining latex to make some more sheets for diaphragm pumps. The idea here was that I'll be able to use the pressure of the fresh water going down the pipes to help push salt water up the pipes because of conservation of energy. It won't be perfectly efficient though, so I'll need another source of mechanical energy to make up for the natural energy losses from friction and such. This will also help prevent the pipes from getting overpressurized. The way I designed these pumps was a little different from the others, in that it fills with water from both sides, just going different directions. As water falls down into the pump, it'll distend the diaphragm on one side, pushing water out and up on that side. Once the diaphragm becomes fully distended to one side, it'll push up or down on a little peg inside the pump that controls whether it's filling or draining. This will facilitate an oscillating action. As fresh water drains out of its side of the pump, its weight will pull a vacuum on the diaphragm, helping to suck salt water into the opposite side while pushing it up from below until the peg resets the valve and the cycle starts over again. By the time I was done with these, it was dark, so I changed out the mesh on the loop and reloaded it so it would work overnight. Then I got ready for bed a little early. I'm glad I got a little extra rest today, since building bamboo frames is a lot easier than lifting masonry. Week 14, Day 2. 
I unloaded the loom after my morning chores and started lining the frames I made the other day with mesh. The frames formed a cylinder on the outside and an arch on the inside to make construction that much easier, and so I won't have to manually assemble a dome or anything. I realized there was a slight problem with my design, in that there really wasn't any way to get the inside frame out or reuse it on the next level once the structure had finished setting. I also needed to leave a gap for an entrance to the tower, so I decided that I'll just leave one side of the C-shaped cistern open to pull the frame out through in sections, before manually sealing that wall up. This required me to make some adjustments to the frame before I could begin pouring. I then realized, however, that this would also change the volume of concrete I needed, and it would probably be safer for me to pour one level of the structure at a time before moving on to the next one. So, I recalculated. If the outside edge is 3 meters in diameter, and if I shrink the walls to 5 centimeters thick, and the inside edge has a diameter of 1.6 meters, to account for the tree trunks, and a thickness of 5 centimeters again, and a height of 2.5 meters, plus the thickness of the ceiling, about another 5 centimeters, then each level will have a volume of about 3.87 cubic meters per story, or about 19.33 cubic meters in total. Using my concrete ratio of 6.67% lime, 13.3% clay, 40% sand, and 40% rock, that means I'll need 1.3 cubic meters of lime, 2.6 cubic meters of clay, 7.73 cubic meters of sand, and 7.73 cubic meters of rock. I've managed to bump up lime production to 12 batches per day, or 96 liters per day. For 1,300 liters of lime in total, that's still going to take me about 13.5 days to make all the lime I'll need, still about two weeks. It would probably take at least three days just to build up enough lime to make one level. I'm actually okay with that because I've been working really hard lately, and I think I'll appreciate the two-day breaks between major construction. I had enough lime stockpiled to make the first level, so I got started after an early lunch and took a break to reload the loom, mixing the concrete up as I went and pouring it into the lined framework. Even taking about five minutes to mix and pour a liter of concrete at a time, it only took me two or three hours to fill the whole level. Not bad, and much easier than laying bricks. I had to clean out a little bit of the slop that fell through the mesh as I went, but I just smoothed it onto the floor of the cistern to help seal everything up. I still had a few hours to kill at the end of the day. My arm was a bit sore from stirring all the concrete. I'm going to be pretty hench by the time this thing is done, though. I decided to finish building the pump system I made the other day, installing the pipes in my concrete structure, and extending the tube up to the top of the tower. I also made a few more membranes of latex, so that I could build the rest of the pumps tomorrow. I still had a couple of hours to kill before sundown, so as I was looking around for something to do, I saw that I never actually finished tiling the ceiling of the bathhouse. So I finished that off and made a note to make some more tiles tomorrow. Then, with nothing better to do with the time I had remaining, I just sat and rested for a while, enjoying the beach. It made me think that maybe I should consider painting some time, so I made a note of it. As the sun started going down, I decided to tidy up around the base because it looks well, like a construction site. I think I'll make this part of my evening routine from now on, so I can keep on top of the mess. I then had dinner, took my shower, and got ready for bed. Week 14, Day 3 I should have enough lime to make the next level today, but I'm a little concerned that the first level may not be finished setting. I think it's better to be safe than sorry right now and I probably need more mesh anyway, so I'm going to wait one more day. I'll leave the scaffolding in place until then. In the meantime, I've got a couple of days to kill and I need to figure out what to do with them. After finishing my morning chores, I had a look at my to-do list and started by making up a batch of tiles and finishing the pumps for the tower. Since I was playing around in the mud, I figured I might as well start working on that electrochemical bubbler. 
it needed a few specific parts. A cap to catch the bubbles, a hose to transport them, and a reaction chamber to do stuff with the reacted gases. The cap wasn't difficult, since I've been making all my pots a standard size, and that's what I've been doing my electrolysis in, I just made a lid to match, but put a partition down the middle of it to keep the different gases from different sides of the cell separate. A couple of holes for bamboo outlets completed the design. Next was the reaction chamber, and it needed to be able to do several different things, since I don't know yet all the reactions I'm going to have to do with it. Bubbling gases through another liquid, distilling, heating in the presence of other reagents, recirculating, etc. I realized for the heating aspect, though, it would be simplest to just use the calorimeter stove in the lab. So I simply built a pot with a channel leading down to its base, which I covered with holes for the gas to bubble out of. I should be able to put the distiller lid on top when needed, like with all my other smaller pots, and I can attach a hose and diaphragm pump to it if I need to recirculate the reactants. This pot took no time at all, and I left it out in the sun while I made some more hoses. While I was at it, I decided I might as well make a few more rubber wheels for the Van de Graaff generators. I ended up making enough for a total of 10 Van de Graaff generators to line the ceiling of the lab, arranged radially from the central axis. Hopefully, this won't block airflow from the fan too much. By wiring them in parallel, sacking their current instead of their voltage, I should be able to bump up electrolysis rates to up to 400 milligrams of copper per week, which is way better. By the time I was done with these little projects, it was lunchtime, and after lunch, I went looking for something else to do. One thing I've noticed over the past couple of weeks, but never got around to, was the fact that I have so much food now, namely fruit from the island, that anything I fail to dry right away tends to go bad. That coupled with the fact that I've now got way more ammonia than I can imagine using from the composting toilet, tells me that I should start resuming ethanol production. It doesn't even need a great deal of oversight. Just put the rotten fruit in the distiller all day, maybe with a modest heat source in the kiln beneath it, and seal the jar at the end of the day. Any fruit that goes bad, goes in the pot. Frankly, I should have been doing that a while ago, but I've been so caught up with other things that I just kept putting it off. Once that was done, the next thing on my to-do list was making paintings. Getting a canvas wasn't too hard. I just used some of my surplus fabric for that, and tied it taut across a simple bamboo frame. The tricky part was getting and making good paints. My sibling would have been a much better expert on this than me, because they're an artist, but I figured there were fundamentally two different sources of pigments I could get. Mineral and organic. As I mentioned before, I want to keep most of my minerals for metal production, since there isn't going to be a lot of it around to begin with. And although copper makes brilliant green and blue pigments, it's much more valuable to me for tools and electronics down the road. That left organic sources, so I took a look around the forest for different pigments, and there were plenty in the forms of leaves and flowers. The turmeric made a brilliant yellow, the red pinecone plants made a wonderful red, the vanilla grass made a good green color, and the yams were already purple. I was familiar with the primary colors and how they could be mixed together to make just about any other color, but the one color I was lacking was blue. My understanding is that it's actually a pretty rare pigment in nature. Turning up nothing, I decided I would just have to content myself with using purple from the yams as the closest substitute, and by watering it down, I could at least get a sort of periwinkle color. Next. I needed to treat my paints and my canvas so they would stick together. I remember on rough science that they needed to treat fabrics with a mordant in order to dye them, and potash seemed to work the best. Fortunately, my fabrics were already manufactured using strong alkalis, but I went ahead and soaked a swatch anyway. As for the paints, I figured what I needed to happen was to dissolve the pigments in a liquid that would later evaporate, leaving the pigments behind and stuck to the canvas. I wasn't sure how well this would work for organic pigments as opposed to mineral ones, but figured water or ethanol would probably be adequate. I experimented for a while with making different kinds of inks and used pulverized wood fibers, 
cloth fibers, and even my own hair to make paint brushes, trying to note carefully the effects of different brushes and what shapes or textures they would be best at creating. Once I had my canvas and paints, though, I realized I didn't really know what I wanted to paint. I was originally thinking of trying to create one of the local landscapes, or a sunset or something. But what's the point if I get to see those things every day? They weren't the landscapes I really wanted to look at anyway. I didn't consider this a waste of time, however, as I might come up with something else I want to paint later. My current painting skills hardly seemed like they would be up to the task anyway. I thought it would probably be a better idea to practice on smaller scale images first, so I got the idea to instead work on simpler subjects, setting aside some blank paper from my journal to make some books dedicated to describing the flora, fauna, and minerals of the island. This way, I can get used to drawing small objects accurately before moving on to big paintings once I have some of the fundamentals down. This kind of naturalist's art plays more to my strengths anyway, and these books will also make good quick references for future projects as my knowledge grows. I made a note to make more paper soon, and left some of my wood scraps soaking in alkali. Since I already had a good deal of botanical drawings and descriptions already made, and since rocks wouldn't try to run away, I decided to focus on drawing the various mineral specimens I had access to for the remainder of the day, before cleaning up, having dinner, and going to bed. Week 14, Day 4 First level of the tower has had an extra day to set. Now it's time to start pouring the next level. After my morning chores, I started removing the scaffolding from the first level, chipping it away from the concrete where it dripped through the mesh and glued everything together, before hoisting it up to the next level, which I realized was going to get harder the higher I went up. There also wasn't any support for the outside edge of the framework, so I tied it to the inside framework, knowing that it would be under pressure to fall outward more than inward. The cord will be lost in the concrete, and I'll have to cut it free when I build the next level, but that's fine. I even added some bamboo supports to hold the feet of the frame up, just in case. By the time I finished laying the mesh, it was time for lunch, so when I'd finished eating, I started mixing and pouring the concrete, praying that the cords would hold and I wouldn't lose it all in a huge tidal wave of liquid rock. Fortunately for me, it held, and when I was done, I decided to learn from my previous mistake and make a sort of lip on the outside edge of the top of the level, so the frames will have somewhere to sit next time. It again reminds me of the segmentation of bamboo or reeds, and I love it. I had a few more hours to kill before the end of the day, so I pulled the bubbler and Van de Graaff generator parts from the kiln and set them up in the lab to get metal production really moving. It looks really cool, all those machines in the ceiling of the lab whirring and occasionally sparking away, like some kind of turn-of-the-century mad scientist laboratory. It seems appropriate. I also set a small fire going in the lab kiln to see if I could start making some of that potassium peroxide with the bubbler, because oxygen bubbles were definitely starting to increase in quantity. By the time I finished these projects, the day was over. Time flies when you're pouring concrete, I guess, so I started getting ready for bed. Week 14, Day 5 the second level was setting, but there was still more for me to do. After my morning chores, I pulled some bricks from the courtyard to seal up the open sides of the cisterns, making these walls a bit inset before covering them with grout and filling in the cracks as well as I could. I figured this was going to probably be the weakest point in the structure, so it would be a good idea to make it the thickest and strongest, though at the same time, I left a small gap near the top of the wall so I can wiggle into the cistern should I need to conduct repairs, or if water needs to overflow for some reason. While I was at it, I built a bamboo floor for the gap on the second level. It didn't need to be concrete, and it may be better for it to be permeable in the event of a leak anyway. I realized at this point that I could make the walls for each level and still get the inner scaffolding out of it 
if I just didn't cast the roof for this gap area in front of the elevator. So I made a little more scaffolding and filled the outer wall of the gap area in, leaving a circular hole in it for a window. By the time I finished and left this section setting, it was lunchtime, and after lunch, I started looking for a few other things to do. One thing I've noticed as I work on these concrete projects is that I'm making some large depressions in the beach in front of my base, and it reminds me of something I heard about once called illegal sand mining, where people would steal sand from beaches for construction projects. I guess that's me, and I'm not totally happy about it. These pits have started to fill with water, though, and that gave me an idea to try making something good out of them. I gathered up a bunch of rocks and placed them near my trot lines. Then I used my wheelbarrow to empty out the sand there for lime production later, and lined the pit with the rocks and used a little concrete to keep it all watertight. The idea was for this to become a big tide pool that I could use to store some of the fish I catch alive since I haven't been eating as many of them now that I have fruits and veggies to supplement my diet. I also feel like it's kind of a way to give a little life back to the island and ocean after all I've taken from it. Next, after all the paper I set aside for making books the other day, I thought I could probably use some more. So I gathered my wood scraps and started grinding and soaking them in alkali. Finally, even though it's a bit late in the day, I noticed I was beginning to run out of pots, so I turned a few on the potting wheel before coming back to my paper pulp, squeezing it, and leaving it out to dry for the night. Week 14, Day 6 My next batch of lime was ready today, so after my morning chores, I started the cycle over again and moved the scaffolding to the third level before fixing it all in place. Things were getting harder, though, the higher I went up, because I had to bring the binder and filler materials up the elevator with me. More elevator rides, more time and energy. It was lunchtime before I actually started mixing and pouring concrete, and by the time I was done, I only had one hour to kill before the end of the day. So, having worked so hard, I just took a breather to watch the sunset before cleaning up, having dinner, and hitting the sack. Fortunately, I've got Sabbath tomorrow. Week 14, Day 7. Time for a break, which is always a bit of a double-edged sword for me, though I have a few ideas for things to do today, and I'll still keep the lime kill. During my morning chores, I got an idea for a modification to my trot line system, which probably needs some repairs by now anyway. Once my morning chores were complete, I gathered some materials and started building another small wind turbine and some wheels and cord to transform the power. By connecting these to the crankshaft on the trot line mechanism, I can allow it to run continuously without my intervention, dragging and dropping fish into the tide pools automatically. This won't work, however, unless I have some kind of device that automatically removes the hooks. But I was having a hard time thinking of a mechanism that wouldn't be overly complicated, like making the hooks mechanically retractable, or one that wouldn't injure the fish, like a pair of rollers that the curved hook would be pulled through, but might also pinch the fish between them. This would have also been a problem if the fish swallowed the hooks. What I came up with was somewhere in between. I carved some new fish hooks to replace several that had been lost over the past few months, but designed them so that they would slide through a narrow piece of bamboo that I hollowed out and put a slot in. As the trot line is dragged along, the snoods will be drawn into the slot. At the end of the small piece of bamboo, I installed a small telescoping section with a little wooden spring in it. The very tip had a small perpendicular peg through it with a gap large enough for the line to slip through, but not the hook, which would be forced to curve around the peg. As the fish presses against this part of the mechanism, it'll lever the hook out of the tissues, freeing the fish into the tide pool, and because it's on the end of a very long, narrow shaft, it can reach down into their stomachs to remove the hook if necessary. 
once the hook is loose, the shape of the pegs will cause the hook to rotate until it leaves the mechanism, following the rest of the trot line back into the sea. I tested it out on a few of the dead fish leftovers from this morning to make sure it wouldn't take so much force to remove the hooks that it would break the fish. But once I was satisfied, I assembled everything and left it to run automatically from now on. Because this would be running at night as well, I decided to make a few different sizes and shapes of hooks to catch different animals. I'm hoping to catch a few squid, not because I want to eat them, but because I want to see if I can collect their ink. These squid jigs incorporated sharp thorns from various plants on the island, higher up on the hook where they would be less likely to get caught on a fish's jaw. At this point, I decided to take an early lunch before moving on to something a little simpler, namely getting on with my encyclopedias of the island's minerals, flora, and fauna. Since I had a few fish in the pond already, and had become extremely well acquainted with their internal anatomy after having gutted so many of them over the past months, I decided to sit in the shade on the beach and start describing and drawing a few of them. It occurred to me at this point, thinking back to what happened to the native Polynesians of the island, that I have no idea what impact my fishing is having on the local reef ecology. So in addition to my biological and anatomical descriptions of the fish, I made a section where I could start counting how many of each fish I catch over so many days, so I can get an idea of their population densities in the reef, and if they're changing seasonally or globally over time as a function of my living here. Time flies when you're just writing and drawing, and I found it very satisfying, even if I wasn't making something practical. There were so many different species of fish, along with mollusks and corals out in the reef, that it occurred to me that I may need to make a separate book for aquatic fauna specifically. So at the end of the day, I spent a couple of hours making some more paper before cleaning up and heading to bed again. That's no moon. That's a blooper reel. Testing the microphone! This project is going to take me two weeks no matter what, so I guess I actually have plenty of time. <coughs> Why is my voice so gravelly today? Some of it I peeled and some of it I peeled and put on the loom. I thought I said I was going to pre-read before I started writing. Hold on. Make it waking up the microphone again. Now where was I? But they also kind of make a lovely cobblestone courtyard around the base of the tower, if nothing else. I should wait until I have a uh, less gravelly voice to do this goodness. Okay, let's try this again. That I could line the tower's bamboo frame with a mesh and fill it with... Which I reinfer... Which I... Which I reinforced? Which I reinforced with... <laughs> See, scroll, scroll, come on, scroll, scroll for me. Come on, scroll, scroll for me. Thank you. The idea here was that I'll be. The idea here was that. I, okay, reading ahead doesn't seem to work, so I'm just. I'm, I guess I'm just gonna go back to what I was doing. Record! Week 14, day 2. My nose itches. <laughs> That's funny. I've managed to bump up lime production to 12 batches per day, or 96 liters per day. Did it stop? Oh, for goodness sake. Off to a great start. In that there wasn't really any way to get the inside frame out, or reuse it on the next le- Or- Hold on. Words. In that there wasn't really any way to get the inside frame out for reuse on the next level. You know, that's just fine. Still about 1,300 liters of lime. That's still going to take me 13.5 days to make all the lime I'll need. Still about two weeks. I think there's a typo in there somewhere. Pause. I had enough lime stockpiled. Wait, there should be a break there. Zzz. Listen to me, microphone. It looks really cool, 
all those machines in the ceiling of the lab whirring and occasionally sparking away, like some kind <sighs> Cat sounds. Why is the house tapping? Time for a break, which is always a bit of a double-edged sword for me. Though I have... Hmm, clattering. There were so many different species of fish, along with mollusks and corals out in the reef. There were so many... Now, where the heck was I? Let's see, um, sand mining. Short one. Hey there, thanks for listening all the way to the end. Even if it didn't take as long as usual, it tells the algorithm that the video is good and worth sharing, so I still appreciate it. Although the episode was a bit shorter this week, the water tower project is taking longer than planned. However, I have every intention of finishing it next week for sure, come heck or high water, literally. So, if you want to be there with me when it happens, you can press these subscribe and bell buttons to get notified as soon as I'm ready to cut the proverbial ribbon. While I'm not doing this for money, it would still help me out more than anything else if you could share this video with someone you think would enjoy it. And since you enjoyed it enough to watch it this far in, you can press the like button if you want to say so, and your thumbs up will be honorarily imprinted in the setting concrete of the tower forever. There's also a dislike button you can press if you didn't like it, but your hand might get stuck in the concrete if you do. Just a warning. Also, if you'd like to chat about your own stories and perspectives on the episode, Maybe a project you did, or are in the middle of right now, that's taking longer than you thought, and your tricks for how to deal with that sort of thing. Please feel free to engrave them in the cements, that should read comments, section below. I'd genuinely love to hear them, and I'm always open to suggestions and corrections. That said, thanks again for listening, and hope to see you here again next week.